I'm Kristen Boddy. I'm the membership and events manager here at the Asheville Art Museum. I want to thank you all for being here for today's member program featuring local artist Kevin Hogan. Um, in chatting with Kevin as we were preparing for today's program, we realized he has an extremely diverse body of work and it would not be possible for us to fit uh, his entire artistic journey into an hour long program. However, I do hope you enjoy hearing about some highlights and about his recent work today. Um, and so before I turn this over to Kevin, I just want to go over some housekeeping for all our attendees. First, uh, you should note that all microphones are muted by de default. Uh, second, you should also know that we are recording today's program. So if you prefer not to be recorded, please be sure to leave your video off. And both the microphone and video camera symbols at the bottom left of your screen will have red lines through them to indicate that they're off. We will be sharing a recording of today's program in tomorrow's e-blast. Um, and third, you do have two options for asking questions or making comments. The first is to type your question or comment into the chat box, which you should also find at the bottom of your screen. And I encourage you to enter your questions as we go. Uh, we will get to those during some breaks in the presentation. The second option is to use the raise hand feature, which you'll find by clicking on participants at the bottom of the screen. And when there's time, I'll call on anyone with a raised hand, unmute your audio, and you can speak directly to Kevin. Um, I will send an evaluation out this afternoon so you can share any feedback you have about today's program. And please do let us know if there's anything you think we can do to improve our programs within Zoom. Um, it's very helpful for us to have that information. And last, as members, I do want to thank you all for your ongoing support of the museum. This has been a challenging time and we've now been closed for about four months. Um, and if you're able, I do ask that you please consider donating to the museum, renewing your membership or purchasing a membership as a gift. Uh, your contributions make it possible for us to continue serving the Western North Carolina community and beyond. I'll include a link to our donation page in the chat box for anyone who is interested. And I wanna thank you again for your support. And now I will unshare my screen and turn this over to Kevin. I think you have to unmute yourself, Kevin. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. Good to see you. Um, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I think I've got this all pretty much figured out for a rather um, full, if not seamless and complete uh, presentation. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, and I believe everybody now should see my first slide, which I'll just stay on as I begin my presentation. Um, I thought I'd begin with a little history. And generally speaking, when I talk to uh, people in North Carolina, I talk about um, my history from uh, our beginnings in Asheville. Um, Joe and I moved here uh, to Asheville in 1979 from Kent, Ohio, where I was attending graduate school at the School of Art at Kent State University. Um, prior to that, I was at Cooper School of Art in Cleveland, Ohio, um, which is where I made this piece, which is really the first major piece that, um, that, that was shown um, in a significant venue. It was selected for an Ohio painting show that uh, was curated by Don Eddy in, um, 19, let me think now, 75, I guess. Um, I, I kind of, big influences from Judd um, and process, minimalism was emerging, obviously, at that time. Painting was dead. Uh, this is roofing paper and wood chips. The roofing paper has been treated with oil and, and um, uh, some charcoal has been applied. Then they're folded and hung on strings on the wall 
falling to the floor into the bed of uh, dust. Um, I then began getting involved in um, more alternative spaces. Um, I had been um, a young gallery director at NOVA, at, at the New Organization of Visual Arts in Cleveland. Um, it was rather conventional, although vibrant, um, and not much experimental stuff was going on. So a group of people got together and started what's now known as Spaces. Um, this is an early installation and performance from spaces in Cleveland, 70, 76, maybe 77. Uh, I then went to Kent. Um, this is one of the first pieces I did at Kent that appears in the newspaper. It's a, it's a room um, and you can read their change. It was one viewer at a time could go into the room and um, manipulate a series of light boxes and envelopes that were translucent. Um, interesting um, that translucency has always been um, an important part of what I, it, what I do. Um, this is another piece that I did at Kent, a major public project. There was a, a raft um, built for the Cuyahoga River. It's a musical raft. Um, the wheels that you see rotate and drive uh, pegs that alternately hit piano um, strings on one board and um, drums on the other. Um, this, was in, this was a major project and, and um, it lasted a day and a half uh, before it was vandalized and stolen and rafted down the river, which I really kind of liked. And I have, I have parts of it that I recovered. It was quite a project. Um, I, you know what, at Kent, I kind of decided that, you know, the academic life was not for me. Um, I don't know, it's just, just not for me. So Joe and I started to look for places to go and um, we were always interested in um, outdoors, the mountains and um, proximity issues to family and so forth led us to investigate North Carolina and Western North Carolina specifically. So in the summer of 79, we drove down to uh, North Carolina with the intention of starting in the West and moving East. And so um, when we drove over, drove over on what is not, what is, was 40, I guess, um, from Knoxville to Asheville, uh, we, didn't, we didn't go any further. Uh, we were just absolutely gobsmacked by the place and quickly went back to Kent and um, came back not knowing anybody or anything, just falling in love with the place. Um, I then started doing, I, I'm jumping here, um, and I, I first got involved in Asheville with the guys down at Highwater um, and did a show um, in 79 at Highwater but we quickly moved out to Madison County and I started doing these big charcoal drawings, which are, um, you know, five feet square. This one's probably by seven by five. And doing these, doing these out, on Mad out in Madison County on a beadboard wall so that the beadboard is um, showing, you can't see that so much in these slides, but, um, and then kind of emerge, getting more reductive, very chaotic, very kind of apocalyptic. Um, um, the broken fence form was kind of a prominent feature in Madison County in those days. Um, dominant male figures, multi-limbed dominant male figures, submissive, uh, subordinated women figures. Um, rather grim stuff, really. Um, spills and um, floods and uh, kind of new imagist in, in a broader context. Um, getting into later stuff, this is, these are much larger, they're still quite large, two, five, about four and a half by four and a half each panel. Charcoal drawings just pinned to the wall underneath a plexiglass box, basically 
shown at the Mint Museum in a series of uh, drawings done for a, an exhibition in 90, I think, um, with text. Um, he is the violent container. She is the victim, the one who mourns. Um, then I, I kind of, you know, I got more into, uh, like, I want to make stuff. I want to, I want to uh, build things. Um, and so I trans translated the imagery into um, installation work, more sculptural work, still rather flat, obviously, a theatrical kind of a set. Um, this is a piece that I did in Cologne in, um, I think, uh, 90, 91, maybe. Um, and um, I did a series of these. Um, here's another one. Um, for a while there in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, Lenore had a great uh, sculpture competition at a park. And uh, Lenore um, is uh, just uh, east of Asheville, about an hour and a half. Um, small town, furniture town, I think, originally. Um, and somebody had, in the local arts council had started this rather popular sculpture uh, competition and show, and they got people to come by giving a thousand dollar prize. So a group of us in Nashville would go pretty regularly and spend the weekend and do stuff. And they had this uh, um, handball court that was abandoned. And I used it quite a bit. We did a lot of stuff in there. Um, let me move along. Um, and, you know, at this time in, in Asheville, um, there's another one of the piece in Cologne. And I was doing a lot of drawing on the, on the walls. Trans, you know, the big paper pieces were great, but they're, they're difficult to handle. And, um, and, and the wall can be dealt with, even with charcoal. So this is um, emblematic on the left of the barges in the, um, the Rhine. And at the back, a, a truck form that I a kind of a a draped uh, bed of a truck form. And then again, the, um, the fence is developing strangely into the ellipse as we go forward. Um, let me go to, uh, let me see. At at about that time too, I I had done uh, performance work, obviously on my own, and I had done some collaborative work. Um, at that time, we, there was a pretty intense social group in Asheville, and um, a group of guys uh, that I knew: uh, Heinz Kostler, Larry Cavini, and uh, Gary Bird, Wade Ryan, Tony Bradley. Rob Amberg, a, a lot of, well, more people, but uh, specifically this project was a, a performance that was done at the Cleveland Performance Arts Festival in, I think, 91, um, called uh, Level Evil Spill Station Fill Station. And um, the Level Evil came from Asheville, Cleveland, in the uh, Richard Craven tradition of chopping words up into dual meeting meanings we asked him if we could use it and we he, he was fine with it um typical kind of apocalyptic uh spill you know uh create we created this high pressure situation where somebody was creating a, a a leak and somebody else was trying to fix it and that went on quite for quite a while um and uh elements were uh developed as the as the piece um, remained in place for a while after the performance, which I think lasted about an hour. Um, I you know and, and I get to very um, conventional at times. I more often than not will revert back to drawing. Um, that you know the drawing has always been an important element at, for me. But um, color began to emerge. Um, I had resisted it for the longest time. 
Um, and I began to print. Um, and that's an interesting story because um, I had resisted it in school. And when we first got to Asheville, um, r rather quickly, well, this would be probably um, mid eighties, I guess now, um, late eighties. Um, I met Porch Buck, Porch and Lewis Buck. And Porch had the Intaglio Relief Society on Monfort Avenue, which was her print shop in the basement of her house uh, on Monfort. And she had two gorgeous French tool presses and told me that I could come and print and she would help. And she charged me $10 a night <laughs> and I couldn't resist. It was just too, it was just too much. And so she eventually moved out to the river in what's now the Riverlink building. Um, and that became her shop and Lewis's studio upstairs. This was made down there. Um, this is from the Cleveland Mechanism series. Um, and so printmaking sort of introduced color into the work. Um, and, you know, we spent time down on the river. We, uh, in 94, opened up Asheville Working Press um, in the old Chesterfield Mill, which burned in 95. And we lost, I lost the press and a lot of people lost a lot of stuff. Um, but at that time, this is 95 now, um, I went to New York for about three or four months and printed at Brand X just as a kind of a cleansing after the fire. And um, generated a body of work. Um, this is a large silk screen, like 50 by 30 maybe, um, with, uh, with Tom Little and then um, also uh, took them down to Kent and um, worked on them um, with relief and um, uh, other processes in Kent. Um, and that was a great um, uh, experience for me. I, um, Tom had been a friend from Kent. Um, he's no longer with us. A fabulous, well-known printmaker who um, I worked with first in 84, uh, predating this work when they were on 27th and then they moved to Varick and, and this is where that was made. Uh, we made some larger ones. Um, some of you may have seen them. Uh, but anyway, Tom was a constant um, a source of inspiration and support in the work. And um, he would visit here. We, uh, I'd visit him in New York pretty regularly. This is one that um, went down to uh, went down to Kent. We boxed a bunch up and took them to Kent. Gary Bird and, and I, and he assisted, and we put these on the big French tool press. The moray pattern is essentially the silkscreen ground, um, and the rest of it is printed um, relief. So I really, you know, I got jacked up about uh, printing. Um, but also continued to make paintings. This is uh, a later painting, but just pops up um, here uh, as, a, as a reminder of my constant desire to go back and forth, the one to inform the other. This is a relatively recent print that um, mixes relief and silkscreen. Um, Going back to the mechanism series, this is uh, 92. Um, this is this was shown in an exhibition which began my kind of sojourn down into Charlotte. Um, uh, I started the show with Hodges Taylor after the uh, exhibition at the Mint Museum. This is a collage and um, oil pastel. Um, and that, that turned out to be um, a very good situation too, because um, when I first went down to Charlotte in, in the early 80s, it was pretty sleepy. Um, and friends of mine from Kent had moved there um, in the early 80s and things started to develop. And um, in a lot of respects, I kind of liked it. 
Um, and um, so I began a relationship with uh, Dot Hodges and then subsequently Ruth Ava Lyons at um, Center of the Earth uh, and had shown there for, for many years and then got involved with the Innovation Institute at the McCall Center, um, which was about a 10 year program. Um, the Innovation Institute is about a 10 year program uh, where the, sort of the creative class meets the executive class. Um, it, it, it developed into other things, but that's how it began. And that turned out to be a, a pretty interesting um, relationship and uh, dialogue over the years. Um, I still go down there. Their, their program has, has changed somewhat, but they're still committed to the residence program. Um, you know, Asheville is, is great in that it's, so it's equidistant. And that was one of the reasons that we liked it um, so much uh, when we first got here. I'm gonna jump a little bit um, to a painting. Um, this is jumping maybe from that last image, uh, almost 12 years, I guess. Um, this is a, an acrylic on canvas, um, part of the uh, post flux mix series, one of the first ones. Um, it uh, it's rather directly uh, painted uh, by hand in um, primary colors, uh, much the way I print, but with a lot of white space, obviously. Um, and um, so I, the, the challenge for me very often in, in going from one medium to the other is scale. Um, this is um, 76 inches square. Um, and it's just about all I can handle to, um, to literally move it around or stretch it or, um, or deal with it in the studio. Um, this is another one from the um, from that same series, which some of you may be familiar with. It's in the collection at the museum, um, and I what I do with these is that I um, I pin them to the wall, work them on the wall, take them off the wall, and then um, work them on a table, put them back on the wall, take them off, and put them on a the table. So it's it's a pretty arduous process, and as I say, this is about as big as I can operate, and um, and feel comfortable and uh, and relatively safe. This is another one, a later one from that series. Um, again, acrylic on canvas. Um, jumping back a little bit to two thousand. Silk screen and acrylic on on a panel, um, and that's a jump there of almost fifteen years. Um, the ellipses um, have developed out of the early figurative work, and it was a kind of a reductive process where the figure sort of reduced as you saw in um, some of the earlier images uh, where the figural references sort of start to break down and become more abstract. Um, these are uh, a, some large paintings in an exhibition in Charlotte recently, uh, again on a 76 inches square canvas, stretch canvas. And the one on the left um, has been um, it's different and it's more recent. There's a, about a fifth, well, more like about a 12 year stretch between the one on the right and the one on the left. Um, I developed a, a, a device. Um, it's, a, it's an ellipse guide, which allows me to draw ellipses on the wall or on canvas on a table which allows me um, to move from the hand 
draw an ellipse to a more mechanical ellipse. Um, and that is frankly somewhat subtle, um, but is an important distinction for me and is a contrast that I have employed um, often in the printmaking and drawing. Um, this is the ellipse guide kind of in action uh, at a exhibition in Cleveland at Spaces for their 40th anniversary. Um, the space that I was telling you about that I helped put together in the late 70s in Cleveland. And 40 years later, they invited me to participate in this exhibition. And um, this was the result. Um, it's, a, it's a lot about place, the, the uh, Liverpool, uh, Cleveland, and Asheville. Um, A series of elements that come together that sort of tell a cryptic history of of, uh, of me and and the work. Um, this is an image uh, carved in um, plaster um, of the house uh, me and my family lived in Lakewood, Ohio, and the little gold window up top was my bedroom and studio. Um, I, as I look back, I um, I, I look back very fondly of my years in, in Lakewood in school. Uh, I had the good fortune of um, attending a school system that really appreciated the arts and um, understood it, its importance in the broader context. And um, I was very fortunate. Um, and so, uh, this is the group of these um, carved plaster pieces that were part of the work, alluding to my mobility work and opportunities. <laughs> um. Hey, Kevin, I don't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to make sure you're aware of the time. It's almost one o'clock now. And I want to see if you wanted to take any questions. Certainly, if there are some, sure. Sure. So we have one from Judy Upjohn, who's asking, to what extent do you map out or plan the composition before you start applying the medium? Good question. Um, uh, let's look at this one in that context. Um, this is a dispersion. This is a watercolor dispersion. It's quite small. It's about nine inches, maybe by seven. And um, I'm dropping very wet um, uh, pigment and very, uh, very um, not very saturated pigment, very loose, almost water in these areas. And using a straw to blow and create the line, right? And that develops. And then I come back and I add more pigment to areas as it's still wet and is dispersing. And sometimes I'll go back with the straw and I'll blow something out. I might blow something out here and then add a little on the end there. Um, it's, it, at, at its base, it's, it's a very playful thing at this level. Um, but when you do something like that in New York City, you better have your plans lined up. So uh, it's both. Um, I like to um, also, you know, with something like this, this that's, that happened in Cologne. All of that sh stuff was shipped from Asheville. And I took my materials with me and did it in an unknown space. They were great. They were really tremendous. But um, I, it took me two weeks and a tremendous amount of effort. And, um, I had to, I had to, it was a lot of planning, a lot of talking to airlines, talking to raising money, all kinds of stuff. Um, this is a good shot for that question. Um, here's the ellipse guide on the table, working a piece of canvas. Um, there's a completed painting. There's that other painting in process. 
that you saw stretched and exhibited in an earlier slide. And then here's one that's in process. So um, I, I have the luxury and I have determined in my life it's very important to live with things for a while before you kind of release them. And so I, I work something and then I look at it a lot um, and evaluate it. And I'll put it in these drawers and sometimes won't look at it for a long time. Um, so that's a, it's, 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 it's a relative unknown. Um, there are more, you know, this is again part of the uh, Spaces exhibition, 40, 40th anniversary exhibition. There was a tremendous amount of work put into generating images for projection. So I did all of this research, <coughs> excuse me, and I'm still working on GIS um, material uh, to augment the work, where you see this sort of mixing of physical elements drawn and painted elements on the wall and projected elements on the wall. Um, this kind of physical and um, technical craft, for lack of a better term, approach to making things is, is really appealing to me. And I love the results. I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not necessarily thinking so much about um, how it's going to look eventually, I have confidence in, in my ability to explore interesting areas. They're, all, they're very difficult to swallow, um, at first for me personally and for other people sometimes, but um, this one particularly is growing on me. Um, and then there are other things that I, you know, this is from 99, I, have, I, I do watercolors pretty much all the time. And it's, it's sort of like a subset um, of, uh, of work. And I, um, this is a, from a series of this sort of um, unknown, you know, pipe device kind of floating in space. Um, but again, exploring possibilities for uh, wet on wet and um, again, scale issues. Um, then I think given the time, we should probably move on and, and look at something like um, talking about um, planning um, with this, um, the elevator at the museum, um, which uh, began as um, an invitation to um, do an installation of some sort in the elevator um, for the new opening of the museum. And um, so um, I, 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 I was, you know, honored and agreed. I, uh, I, I, I did uh, hesitate, honestly. Um, but the more I thought about it, the more I liked it. Um, and uh, I thought, I, I mean, I thought about it probably for six months um, and had all kinds of ideas, including just being in the elevator and talking to people, um, you know, giving an elevator pitch, um, that kind of thing. But I had, um, in the process of doing my residency at McCall in, um, in Charlotte, I used their computer lab to digitize a lot of my images. And so um, Robert Zimmerman and I used those images for what was Fluxmix, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, and that, um, th that sort of laid latent for a while. And then I began to investigate um, digitizing um, the imagery and then working over it with uh, Photoshop and then exclusively working with Photoshop. And I found Photoshop, although I had just been using it to um, size images, I found Photoshop to be entirely consistent with printmaking. It's, 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 um, it's, just, it's just layering. 
um, and relative density and saturation and opacity. And so I started playing with it and I got, was getting some nice results. And um, in the process of evaluating all kinds of possibilities for the um, elevator, it was obvious to me after a while that the, the easiest way to deal with it and have it last was to stick something to the panel that's going to stay there for a while, at least a year. And um, any appendages were going to be issues. And the original idea was to work on the panels and then apply them. That became a problem just because of the construction demands and, and code. So um, this is just the first time that I had um, somebody print uh, commercially uh, images uh, for the work. And, um, you know, just very excited about it and um, just uh, think it's great. And I, you know, I, um, it's hard to speak about it technically because um, um, it, it sounds cryptic, the language gets a little cryptic, but essentially it's, um, it's the same kind of approach that I use, which is basically CYMK, the primary colors overlaying each other um, to create various effects and color. And within Photoshop, it's expanding all the time, the ability to manipulate it in its relative density and um, opacity so that you're getting something very different. Although remember, you're looking at something on a screen here as opposed to, um, in real life. So the luminosity issue becomes uh, a question, although uh, and really interesting possibilities too. So we started thinking about, well, why not we could print on plexiglass and look at it from both sides. And so um, I started to uh, talk with Rocky um, down at uh, Dot Editions and he does some wonderful work for photographers primarily, but all different kinds of artists in the documentation and printing of their work. Um, and we began to talk about a collaborative effort to, to take some of the imagery that I had generated, some of the digital imagery, and um, apply it to a plexiglass um, substrate. So um, that sort of laid latent up until the, the pretty much the end of last year. And um, it just so happened that a good friend of mine um, was making some really wonderful work. And I told him, I said, you just made this great piece and I love it and my wife really loves it. You want to do a trade? <laughs> and I do that. I've done that quite a bit. Um, over the years, um, and uh, at any rate, so he agreed, and the, that piece, the piece that I wanted existed, and my general practice is, well, you know, you give me what I want, and you get, you know, you get what you want, and you come to the studio, pick something out. Well, when they came to the house, it was, um, they already have a lot of work, and we started talking, and I told them that I had this, um, this uh, plan for a, um, a prototype applying the imagery to plexiglass and sandwiching it. And um, so they said, wow, that's great. Um, I don't know, what do we, we, well, we're talking about redoing the railing. And so um, they had, um, created this, or, well, they were hoping to create a new railing and were speculating on, um, on how that might work. Um, and I said, well, you know, um, I'm doing this plexiglass thing. Why don't we talk about doing a prototype and having a look at it and seeing if it would work as a kind of a glass railing effect. Um, so, uh, After some time, 
Um, and COVID delay, um, and a kind of a meeting of the minds with the with the design of the railing and the possibilities with Rocky for how this sandwich might work, we, um, and I'm going to have to find this image. Um, pardon me while I do this. Kevin, Pardon. while you're looking for the image, perhaps you could answer another question oh, from one of great. the attendees. Um, so Michelle had asked, um, let's see, uh, the ellipse has continued throughout your work and does it have any meaning for you? Um, well, the, the ellipse to me is just fundamental. You know, I, to me, it's a, it's a kind of a, it's been an ongoing process of, of back and forth, of investigating, moving towards the singularity, and then moving back towards the, the field. Um, the singularity meaning the, you know, the, a traditional approach to a figure ground relationship, where the portrait or the, uh, the image sits on a ground. Um, here you see that to the left right in the painting to the left the yellow form essentially is establishing a singularity floating on a field of blue similarly with the one on the right where the image floats on a on a cream white ground um, in the middle they're really mixing together um, to me it, it's very much a formal exercise in exploring those relationships and possibilities in basic ways and allowing them to be as, as evocative as they possibly can be and pushing them and pulling them back when they do become evocative or more or less so. Um, and I don't, I, I've never really felt too strongly, although it's difficult to look at this and say this, but um, I've never been, um, that strong about trying to get a message across. Um, although this work, maybe I was. And that, you know, um, I think when you're younger, you, you, you're more inclined to pursue um, social issues. Um, this, this is re really rather grim work. And I, I felt, you know, that it, it, the meaning was a little overwhelming, apocalyptic. Um, this is evocative in the same kind of way, um, but it's quite beautiful. I don't think this is ugly, but it's, it's, uh, it's very strong. And I, I like it for that. I mean, it's, it's very powerful work. But, um, you know, this is something recent, very recent, um, generated with the Ellipse Guide. This is a print um, where that question um, uh, is particularly pointed because it's, it's, it's evocative, it's elusive, it's, it's, I, I think it's quite beautiful. Um, but what does it mean? Um, I, 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 th I think that, you know, a lot of times in my life, I have struggled between trying to come to grips with the complexities, uh, the difficult complexities of life and the apparent um, truthfulness of the simplicities of life. Um, and this kind of goes to that question where um, it's extremely complex and intentionally so, but it's meant to just hit you immediately and go, wow, that's pretty cool. Wow, that, what is that? Um, and, you know, th um, that's a powerful image. And I generated that by hand on a plate first and then printed it 
and these are three different prints, three different proofs that were pulled in Cleveland. And now I'm thinking about working it through the digital matrix. Um, so again, that's a, that's a technical thing. Um, but I, I think that what I just said was about as good as I can get, in all honesty. Um, it's a, and it, obviously it's about the human condition. And, that, and that's, um, to me, that's the beauty of art, that it, it, it ought to be somewhat elusive uh, because it, it has to be universal and, and a particular at the same time. And it's very, it's very difficult to, um, to be um, universal when you're very particular with your imagery. A lot of people might not be able to read that. Um, this is something very recent. A lot of people may not be able to read that. A lot of people could read that, but um, not everybody. Everybody to some degree can read that in a purely spatial way. You don't have to understand what it means or what it represents, but you understand the cognitive dissonance that's going on with the retinal information you're getting. And that it's also attractive, evocative. This is uh, recent and somewhat similar in that respect. Um, and part of the, um, the COVID uh, um, period, I made some uh, walnut ink. I'm having trouble finding that image, so I'm going to move on. Um, I uh, have been up to all kinds of mischief as the lockdown has developed. And um, one of the uh, things I've been doing is uh, making some um, walnut ink that um, began as, uh, as an exploration into Nuccino. Um, these are green walnuts um, that are the basis for Nuccino. So as um, my son-in-law suggested we might try that, I began to collect walnuts and then um, had an abundance of walnuts and decided to make some walnutting. Um, I made about 110 ounces um, and um, made a, a test sheet um, when I um, got my first batch. Um, this is about, you know, six by eight inches, six by 10, something like that. And just a simple test to see what it would do in terms of like all these issues that I've been talking about, relative density and saturation and so forth and so on. How does it work as a medium? Different applications being ta taped out, being washed on, being heavily washed on and then dabbed off, being overlaid, being lightly washed on, manipulated in a rendering, manipulated in more of a kind of a spacey representation of a landscape maybe. And I thought, wow, this is great. I love this. So um, it's very similar in some respects to this. And I'll tell you why. This, this was generated with, with old um, um, what's the, uh, uh, Martin's watercolors that, have, that were in glass bottles that had been sitting around for 40 or 50 years. And some of the pigment had calcified, if that's the right term. And so the suspension would leave these residues, very similar to what happens with the walnut ink, that does not happen with conventional watercolor. It's too clean. It's too smooth. And so you get these wonderful sort of deposits that you can inten intentionally manipulate and lift off this rather quick little sketch. I love it. And uh, 
Let me show you this one. No, it's too early for that one. But here, look at the, let, that's a watercolor. Look how clean that is. It's so clean. Not that it's easy to make it clean, but you know, you, it can look clean. This is, is really gritty, and earthy. I really like it. It has a, a very strong appeal to me aesthetically. Plus, I, now I got a bunch of it. Um, and so, you know, I, um, I'm in a place where, well, here's, let me show you this too. There's, that's a, a, a preliminary um, element for the, uh, for the elevator. And it's a difficult, you know, looking at it on the screen, again, relative to it being printed out is totally different. And when it's on site, um, you have to come to grips with the, the notion of the translation that, um, that it's in essence a mechanical translation. Uh, and you have to submit to the process, which I'm very happy to do with those sorts of results. Um, and of course, you can decide not to do it. Um, but I, this was just too, you know, just too nice. Similarly, um, with uh, the new prints, it's the, a kind of a, um, a basic physical appeal in the material and process uh, in etching ink that has the same kind of sensual quality that this walnut ink has, that to me um, has the same kind of sensual quality that plaster or white oak has. Um, and even maybe silk screening. That's oil-based silk screening though. Um, So to me, from the really early work, um, more mid-career work maybe, a little later, um, let's get one there. It's still pretty much a formal exercise. And um, the, the process um, and the material very often dictate as much as I try to manipulate them. Um, and every once in a while I do uh, a self-portrait just to keep in touch with it. Um, and so, I'll end with that um, and go back to this just for the sake of not having to look at that. And I just want to um, end with and asking if anybody has any further questions. I tried to run for an hour and I almost made it. You did a really great job, Kevin. <laughs> you covered a lot in uh yeah, and I, I, missed a lot. I missed, I missed, there were gapes and, and I'm, I apologize. Um, it's all new, really. This is the first time I've actually manipulated slides this way. Um, and, you know, when I, when I um, looked at the, when I try and put the images together, it's just maddening. I had, a, um, I had a, uh, an intern from Smith. Oh, no, no, not Smith. Um, Bennington, like maybe almost like five or six, seven years ago, something like that. And she spent... <clears throat> Uh, six weeks filing images for me um, and I'm still trying to get a handle on it um, and, and the medium changes but um, you know uh, hopefully I'll come back and, uh, and I can fill it I, I, I'd, I'd really like to talk to people about you know the history of Asheville in, in the art context 
to um, my personal history. And there's some recent work that I should have shown that's not showing up on my, uh, on my library here. So I apologize for that. Um, any, that's any okay. questions? Yeah, we had some others come in. So Laurel had asked um, a couple of questions, but she wanted to know where you get most of your inspiration and a very difficult question, if you have a favorite work of art of your own. Wow. Um, um, where do I get my inspiration? Um, you know, that's a good question. Um, I'm, I'm not... Um, I have a lot of good people around me, <laughs> always have had, um, who've uh, trusted and uh, believed in me. You know, that kind of, that's, an, that's inspiring. Nature is, is inspiring to me. People in general um, inspire me. I, um, I'm not a big, um, I don't like rush out to see exhibitions. I know I've had, I've had the good fortune of um, doing um, retreats and residencies and meeting lots of great uh, makers and um, a lot some that I have to go out you know like every day see a show see do something see something uh, keep up to track keep on track with uh, with the publications uh, be aware be current and I think that's that's really good um, but I've I chose in some respects isolation um, and, um, and I, for the longest time, I've been in a conversation with myself. So I look back at the work and try and figure out, you know, where I screwed up and what can I do better or more interesting and more. It's just, it's, um, it's one of the significant conflicts in the creative life, I think, is that it's, there's no result. Um, like when I look at this, this is a constant sort of source of, um, um, speculation um, of what I might do, what I could do differently. Um, and I love that uh, about it. Um, and, but it's not, it's not a very practical life. And um, I've just had people around me that, that could put up with that mostly. And um, as far as a favorite piece of artwork, um, that's a really tough one um as it's you know in thinking about this i i thought about my own personal history and when when it really things clicked for me and it, 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 I, I may be able to answer the question with this and i remembered that when i was in my first year at art school david parkinson who was a, an amazing man a great cellist and art historian took a small group of us from cleveland to Buffalo, to the Albright Knox. And if you've never been to the Albright Knox and ever get to Buffalo, you've got to go to the Albright Knox. It's a, a remarkable museum. And he took us there. And um, the thing I remember more than anything was Lucas Samaras's mirrored room. And it just absolutely floored me. And um, there was a lot, there's a, it's an amazing collection and a wonderful history um, funded largely by the Woolworth uh, um, money, but um, at any rate, um, and that that inspired me. So I went on and met Lucas Samars later, and he's really nice, very a very interesting guy. Um, but it it opened up the possibilities for me, and I quickly um, stopped thinking about painting. Although I still think about painting, I, I pretty much abruptly left it then. I said, I'm not going to mess around with painting. I'll still make drawings, but I'm going to, you know, I'm going to move into, um, we used to say, we're in corporeal space. We wanted to be in the room, not on the wall, just a picture. We wanted to be in the room. And I'm, I, I'm still, you know, still interested in that. And Lucas Samar's uh, mirrored room, and he... You know, he built that in 1966, um, a remarkable piece of work. Although I, I, there are others that are, um, uh, 
although I'm not a huge fan of Kapoor, the bean in Chicago is extraordinarily memorable and functions as a piece of art as well as anything I, I have ever seen. But it, talk about the negative side of art in the obsessive compulsive way that whatever it costs, we're gonna do it. Um, you know, you could say that's a little over the top, but it is absolutely remarkable to experience. Um, Donald Judd uh, in the early days, um, Richard Serra. Um, any other questions? I uh, yes, I have one more, um, but I also want to let you know that Karen wants you to know that she sent you an email with some of the images you might have oh. been searching for before, so you might be able to reshare oh, that great. on a different screen. Um, and in the meantime, while you pull that up, uh, Kathy just wanted to say how eloquent you are when you're speaking and was wondering if you ever incorporate text into your work or if you've published any writings. Oh, gee. Um, Kathy's very kind. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I was, uh, my mother um, uh, was um, well-read and a conversationalist. And um, they weren't always easy but we had many conversations and um, uh, as I'm learning with my daughter and son, it comes back to bite you. <laughs> so uh, thank you for that. And I will say too that um, it's, the, it's the value of an education. And I, you know, uh, I left graduate school in a huff. I didn't like graduate school at all. I hated it, um, um, but they still invite me back. Um, but what I did learn there was that um, if you can't talk about the work on the fly, um, what are you doing? What are you doing? And even if it is, I don't know. <laughs> at least you could, you know, at least you could say it, you know. Um, and I think ultimately for a lot of people, I have a lot of respect for um, people um, my good friend Bob Trotman, um, uh, Mel Chin, a friend, um, people who, um, through their work, give people, inspire people to uh, search, to look for alternatives, to try something new, and um, and admit that they don't always get it right, and sometimes it should be more, and um, that drives them. And the result is fascinating, wonderful work to reflect on as a viewer, um, but the maker's on about other stuff. Um, so, and, and I'm grateful to have that impulse as opposed to um, what I was advised also early on is find something, find something that works and stick with it. That was the Yale mantra in the uh, 70s. Um, so, and Lucas Samaras never did that. Um, other people, you know, lots of people don't do that. It's, it's very uncommon today, but um, it was the mantra. Um, so, uh, any further questions? Uh, we're kind of going long here, huh? Well, I think that's about it. Um, are you able to pull up that last image? Otherwise, um, yeah. we can- you, can, I, can I try that? Yeah, absolutely. Pardon me while I do, and in the meantime, what I'll do is um, I will thank Kristen for her help. Um, and of course the museum has, you know, always been really good to me um, in all kinds of ways. When I was on the outside um, yelling through the door or um, when I was on the inside trying to help organize things, um, it's, it's always been a big part of, uh, oh. You're getting a lot of uh, just 
thank yous for the for today's program but i do want to just say this one that just came in from james mccarthy he says so good to see your body of work kevin as they say oh. here in maine you done good <laughs> <laughs> oh <laughs> thanks jim yeah this, this is not quite how i how i would have presented it but you could see it um this is the result this is rob i, I don't think they'll mind this is Robert and Karen Mills, Milne's home, and the uh, the victims of the assault that was this. Um, I think you might need to unshare the current screen and reshare what you're. Oh, uh, oh, I'm you're trying sorry. To show. That's okay, okay. Um, let me see if I can uh, do that. Um, so there's a red button to unshare your screen. Yeah, and then you should be able to reshare with the image you want. Excellent, thank you. So, oh, excellent, that, very good, thank you, Chris. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, this, this is not at all how I would have liked to, but it tells the story. Um, so this is, to carry on this conversation about uh, this railing um, from the trade that developed into a major project involving the Iron Maiden Studios, Athena and Kayla, wonderful uh, iron workers, who did this um, powder coated steel frame railing and handrail on the other side at uh, Karen Milne's uh, direction for uh, placement of these two panels, um, sandwiched uh, plexiglass as you were looking at the prototypes um, between two pieces of glass. And um, the effect is really quite remarkable. You get a little bit of it here. Um, so, you know, that's, that to me is, you know, the, it's, um, it, I was searching for a word yesterday and um, we're, we're sorely missing people like this today, but um, it's the empresario, right? Some people will step up and be the empresario. They'll take the risk. They'll do what it takes. They'll spend the money. They'll, fish out an idea, they'll play it out, they'll accept the fact that it might crash, or they accept and hope that it'll be tremendous and something new. And I sweated this, I really did sweat this. Um, there's something different, something new. Um, and I'm very, very happy with how it turned out. And um, can't wait to get somebody over there to, to photograph it. Um, it, as the prototype did, um, the varying light effects are pretty significant on the um, on both sides where it becomes some more reflective more translucent almost completely translucent um, they have a, a natural light tube at the top which is really kind of nice and um, at any rate so that's that um, and I thank you Karen for that uh, and Robert uh, and again Kristen for all her help um, Pam, as always, um, the museum, as I said, you know, uh, it's come a long way since I came to town 40 years ago, and it was in the basement of the Civic Center. And, um, we're, you know, we're really proud of the, uh, the way it's developed, uh, and can't wait to get back in. Um, you can't wait to welcome everyone back in. Yeah. So. And, um, and I, you know, thank everybody for uh, coming. I'm sure people have bailed already. Um, I had a few other things that I wanted to say, but I've rambled on. Any further <laughs> questions? No, I think that's about it. Um, thank you so much, Kevin. This has been great. And I think, you know, as we're all adjusting to these new circumstances, it's really great to hear from artists like you who are finding new ways to express your creativity and hopefully others will be inspired to find something to also pass their time, maybe over a little glass of Nacino <laughs> um, yeah. or something well, we'll else. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, okay. I also want to thank all our members for joining us today. Uh, some of Kevin's guests who, as I saw in the chat box, are attending from you know as far as Liverpool. So thank you for being here. Um, I hope you all continue to engage with us through these member programs and the other activities we have on our Museum From Home page and some of our other virtual programming going on. As a reminder, I'll send out a program evaluation in a little bit to collect your feedback. Um, and if you are able to, please do consider supporting the museum 
while we remain closed during this time. And I hope you all stay healthy and safe and enjoy the rest of your day. So thank you again and thank you again, Kevin. Thank I you. Hope you all do well. Thank you Bye. All.